The year is 2014. Conchita was absolutely sweeping the Eurovision Song Contest, people were dumping ice cold water over each other for charity, and everyone was freaking out about the possibility of a global pandemic breaking out. <laughs> like that's ever gonna happen. Somebody. In the middle of all of this, film studios were also churning out some of the most inventive, original, and creative films in years. Genre-wise, with science fiction, you had Edge of Tomorrow pushing this entertaining Groundhog Day concept, you had Interstellar showcasing Nolan and Zimmer at their very best, and you also had Guardians of the Galaxy proving once again that Marvel can make box office gold out of literally anything. Almost anything. You have the Joker over here falling in love with Eve. You've got one of the best animated movies of all time acting as the inspiration for one of the worst animated movies of all time. You've got this impressive slice of life story that took 12 whole years to film. And even Irish film got a little bit fun and experimental this year. But undoubtedly, of all the genres that had their time to shine this year, none did so more than the horror genre. With such unforgettable titles such as the fifth paranormal activity, and Sharknado 2, the second one, and of course, who could forget Zombievers? Obviously, I'm exaggerating, as there were plenty of fine horror films which came out in 2014, such as one of my personal favourites of all time, The Babadook. Why can't you just be normal? However, among all the horror movies which came out this year, there's one in particular which has completely polarised me since I first watched it. One which has one of the best concepts for a horror movie I've ever seen, but one which I can never get drawn into beyond just a couple of scenes. I'm talking, of course, about the 2014 cult classic, It Follows, and how a low-budget action film from the 70s beat it at its own game. You're walking home late one night, and you notice that you're being pursued by an unfamiliar figure in the distance. So, you turn into your cul-de-sac, but the figure follows your lead. Or maybe you're driving into work and notice that the car behind you has been on your tail for a few kilometers. So you make a left turn, and then another, and then a right turn. But your pursuer is still right there in your rearview mirror. There's something inherently terrifying about being followed without any context or explanation. Even in a setting as mundane as walking up a staircase on campus, knowing that someone is behind you is weirdly one of my largest fears. It's for this reason why I both admire and resent It Follows. It's a film with excellent cinematography and an equally impressive soundtrack, and the concept itself is so unique with the premise of an STD as the antagonist, which is something that manages to remain fresh for much of the film's runtime. The movie also legitimately has one of the scariest scenes I've ever seen in a film, which is exactly what makes the rest of the film so frustrating to me. There are so many inconsistencies and contradictions within the film, with how the antagonist behaves being one of them. There's this infamous scene, obviously, but even beyond that, just how the film is presented to the audience in many aspects completely ruins the tension of the film. I understand why they decided to make the antagonist visible to show the friends' viewpoints, but I don't understand why the filmmakers decided to do it. Showing us the demon here, then making it invisible again, ruins the tension of the scene. Having the demon play with Jay's hair instead of just killing her as it has so many others, it's not scary, it's just silly. Especially after they've proved time and time and time again that they can make genuinely creepy and suspenseful scenes with the antagonist in full view, or at least off screen, like in the excellent opening scene. In a film with this concept, literally anybody could be the antagonist, anybody could be the pursuer, which is absolutely terrifying. So turning the pursuer invisible occasionally completely destroys the tension. As the inconsistencies mount, it often feels like the filmmakers lost faith in their own script and tried to retroactively make it scarier by changing the rules to catch the audience off guard. 
It Follows is such a mixed bag for me. I enjoy so many individual aspects of this movie, but as a whole, it never came together to realise its full potential as a horror film. So, why do I bring up It Follows in the first place? Well, because of the concept. I think it's such a brilliant concept for a horror movie that was just poorly executed by It Follows. I began wondering if there were similar movies which were more successful in realising this concept, the unfeeling being that will follow you forever and not stopping until it's killed you. And two films immediately came to mind. The first was The Terminator, the classic 1984 sci-fi action thriller with some definite horror elements thrown in there. The second film, which came even before the T-800 donned its iconic shades, was a low-budget action thriller released in 1971. The directorial debut of Steven Spielberg, and personally, one of my favourite horror movies of all time. On paper, the plot of Duel is relatively simple. A regular drive for a commuter descends into a paranoia-induced nightmare as he's repeatedly followed, harassed and assaulted by an imposing oil tanker. Not the driver of the tanker, because make no mistake, the tanker itself is the antagonist of this film. The film wastes no time in placing our protagonist, David Mann, in a position of isolation, with a POV shot gradually transitioning from bustling cityscapes to the empty open road, the sounds of heavy traffic being replaced with near silence. Only when David is alone on the road does the POV shot end, allowing us to see the empty road ahead of him. There's nowhere to hide. Our protagonist, however, is not yet aware of just how vulnerable he is. Shortly after this, David catches up with a massive oil tanker, the sound of which drowns out the mundane radio talk show that he's listening to. David briefly trails behind the tanker before overtaking the truck and speeding ahead. Not a minute passes before David himself is overtaken by the tanker. Hey! David overtakes once again, speeding ahead to a nearby petrol station, followed shortly thereafter by the tanker, the driver of which does not leave at first, but instead just waits, his arm and boots being the closest David and the audience will ever come to identifying the man. After a brief scolding phone call with his wife from inside the station, David once again finds himself on the open road, this time in total silence. When the tanker catches up to David, our protagonist signals for him to pass, but instead of speeding ahead, the tanker slows to a near crawl, refusing to let David overtake him once again. This continues for some time, with David's horns being muted by the mere presence of the tanker, until the driver signals to David, giving him permission to take the lead on the road once again. Well, it's about time, Charlie! Not only is this the first of many times where David's life is directly threatened by the tanker, it's also the first time we hear a soundtrack not coming directly from the car's radio. This is no longer an ordinary commute, something strange is happening here, and David realises it too. Okay. After managing to overtake the tanker by going off-road, David soon notices the tanker in hot pursuit of him. Both vehicles speed up, although while David maxes his speed at 100 miles per hour, the tanker repeatedly hits the rear bumper. David's best is not good enough, and his life is once again directly threatened by the tanker, and just as before, Non-diegetic music overshadows the sound of David's radio. The tanker is now in full control of the nightmare. David narrowly escapes by swerving into the car park of Chuck's Cafe. As the tanker continues on, the music fades away. David has regained some control in this small sanctuary on the side of the road. He's finally some time to think and clear his head. Are you all right? No, I'm fine. What happened out there? Oh, just a slight complication. Oh? Looked like a big complication to me. <laughs> David is trapped. The walls of his sanctuary crumble as he realises that he now shares an interior with his assailant. David's growing paranoia and claustrophobia are expertly portrayed here as he attempts to identify the tanker driver through his boots all while his inner dialogue second-guesses his actions. Why didn't I leave right away when I saw his truck outside? Then I'd know what he intends to do. All eyes are on David, 
but is this because of the driver or the incident that David caused outside? After causing a fight with a person who he falsely identifies as the driver, the tanker leaves anyway. The driver was never in the cafe to begin with. He's taunting David. He has him exactly where he wants him. A moment passes before David continues on his journey where he approaches a stranded school bus and offers his assistance. I also think this whole exchange with the kids is just funny. I love how his priorities are immediately back to the state of his car once his life is no longer directly in danger. But the shot that follows shortly thereafter... I mean, how can you not call this a horror movie? Something wrong? David escapes, time passes, there's a close encounter with a train... But long story short, David ends up at a petrol station and uses their telephone booth to call the authorities where we witness possibly the greatest shot in the entire movie. After driving ahead some more, David finds an area to hide, allowing the tanker to drive ahead. Vowing not to budge for at least an hour. When he awakes from a nap, tentatively putting his foot on the accelerator, once again alone on the road, for the first time in what seems like forever. This illusion, however, is shattered in mere minutes. The tanker was waiting for David the entire time. It was at this moment that I became so engrossed in the film that I just stopped taking notes, but essentially, the climax of the film involves David's radiator coolers failing, leaving him completely helpless against the approaching tanker. In a remarkably tense sequence, David travels down a hill in neutral gear, allowing his car to cool off just enough for him to accelerate to the edge of a cliff, where he's ultimately cornered by the tanker. It's the end of the line, and David has no choice but to finally face his assailant head on. David accelerates towards the tanker, placing his briefcase on the pedal, allowing his car to speed up while he abandons ship at the last second. The tanker, not realising what's happening until it's too late, fails to break in time, sending both vehicles off the edge of the cliff. What's left of the soundtrack are mere waves of light synth, gradually fading out as if the tanker itself is taking its final breaths as it crashes to the ground. We see numerous shots of the tanker, its various parts coming to a final stop. Blood drips from the steering wheel, but the driver is nowhere to be seen, as though the blood is coming from the tanker itself. Finally, the music ends as one of the wheels stops spinning. David is left in silence. The nightmare is finally over. He sits on the edge of the cliff and watches the sunset as the credits rise in silence. The sounds of the natural world only being interrupted by the sounds of David throwing stones into the valley below. The duel was fought and David Mann emerged victorious. The plot of Duel is a simple one, there's no doubt about that, but I think it's that simplicity which really heightens the suspense and tension for me. Simplicity is at the core of good horror, and more often than not, the best horror films are the ones with the simplest concepts. What if a killer shark terrorised a crowded beach town? What if the crew of a space shuttle find themselves stranded in space with a hostile alien life form? What if a man is stalked and terrorised by an oil tanker on a regular commute home? In my opinion, Michael Myers simply crossing the street to attack Laurie will always be scarier than Michael Myers repeatedly rising from his supposed death in the film's climax. Rising from the dead is always inherently creepy and uncanny, but taking something as mundane as being followed across the street by someone can be absolutely terrifying when put into a horror context, like the one from Halloween. <laughs> 
The simplicity of Duel and how effective it is in creating a sense of pure dread, claustrophobia and paranoia from this simple concept is, to me, what elevates it into being an effective and legitimately scary horror film. In addition to this simplicity, however, Duel has far more layers than one first might anticipate, and thematically, there's a lot more going on under the hood. First and foremost, I think that Duel is a film about masculinity, or one's lack thereof. That is, masculinity in the traditional sense, or at least the 1970s sense, where one is concerned with honour and defending that honour at all costs. This isn't just because the protagonist's name is literally man, although that does act like a nice punctuation, but elements of this theme are scattered all throughout the film. This can literally be seen in the film's opening sequence too, with one of the first pieces of dialogue being a radio interview in which a man, feeling emasculated by his wife, wonders whether or not he should label himself as the quote, head of the family in the national census. Hey, one of the first times we hear David speak himself is in a phone call with his wife where she berates him over events which transpired the night beforehand. It's implied that while at a social gathering, David's wife was harassed by another man, although she seems more upset in David for not intervening in the situation, as opposed to the actual situation itself. And challenge him to a fist fight or something. No, of course not, but I mean, I think you could have at least said something to the man last night. I mean, after all... From the get-go, David is established as a man who likes to stay as far from conflict as he can, even at the expense of his own dignity. Throughout the first half of the film, he's portrayed as a man with little self-confidence, an aspect of the film which climaxes in the Chuck's Cafe scene. From his injuries being brushed aside by some older gentleman, Just a little whiplash is all. <laughs> to him being jeered at by the cafe's patrons, What happened out there? Oh, just a slight complication. Oh? Looked like a big complication to me. <laughs> to him not raising his voice to ask for ketchup as the waitress leaves. No, thank you. He never gets his ketchup. He eats a dry sandwich. He just sits there and takes it like a good little boy. <clears throat> Arguably, this is the scene in which David's at his most vulnerable, both physically and mentally. As far as he knows, he's trapped in this space with his assailant, his inner monologue second-guessing himself, then questioning his second guesses. His paranoia has reached a critical point, and yet he'll still do whatever he can to avoid conflict, even going so far as to imagine himself buying lunch for the man he believes to be his assailant as a plea to get him to stop. Look, mister, I'm, I'm sorry if I irritated you. Why don't I buy you a beer and get this thing straightened out, huh? When David does eventually attempt to assert himself, finally standing up to who he believes has been harassing him, it goes about as disastrously as can be expected. David is completely conquered in a brawl, leaving him at perhaps his lowest point in the film, especially following the realisation that the man he fought wasn't even his assailant at all. This scene, however, is also a turning point for David's character in this aspect. When he exits the cafe and runs after the tanker, it's the first time he directly confronts his assailant as opposed to running, or rather, driving away from it. A turning point which we'll observe time and time and time again as the film progresses. We witness David actually standing up for himself and confronting his attacker, sometimes successfully. Sometimes less so. This theme of the film is clear. In the beginning of the film, David is not masculine in the traditional sense. He is a pushover with little confidence or respect for himself or his family. The first time he comes into contact with the tanker, the difference is night and day. If the oil tanker feels blown out of proportion with how its roar overshadows David's radio, or how the word flammable is literally plastered on its rear, it's because it is blown out of proportion. It's not a ghost truck by any means, that's made clear throughout the film, but it is a manifestation of everything David is not at the beginning of the film. It's faster than David, it's larger than David, and clearly it's more powerful than David. It is confidence where David lacks any. And yet, David emerges from the final duel victorious because by the end of the film, he has something more than confidence. Yes, he learns to stand up for himself throughout the film, but he can never amount to the tanker, the sheer embodiment of masculinity and confidence on his own. David could never equal the tanker in that regard. No, David emerges victorious precisely because he is more than that. He's a flawed character who, despite learning to stand up for himself, panics, who makes mistakes, who forgets things, who is forced to act on intuition and not just brute force. David is a person, a character, he is the driver behind the wheel, not just the wheel itself. He is more than just a man. He is 
David man with two ends. In the beginning, this video was intended to be my justification for why I consider Duel to be a horror film, something which I wholeheartedly believe is true by the way, and I'll get to that in a second, but as I rewatched the film and continued writing this script, it began dawning on me that there's so much more to be said about the film than its genre. Fifty years after its initial television release, it's still a wildly entertaining and suspenseful film, and much of that is owed to the proficiency of how the film is crafted, from the genius motif of non-diegetic music acting as the tanker's control over David, to the use of mirrors to create a sense of unease through the idea of constantly being followed. The film, though clearly low budget, certainly doesn't feel like a directorial debut. This definitely feels like the renowned director at his most Hitchcockian. And yes, returning to the original point, I think that Duel is undoubtedly a horror film. Throughout its runtime, and especially in the first half, the film carefully builds an atmosphere of tension and at times actual dread. Like so many of the best horror films, Duel is a film which is strongly grounded in reality, where something as ordinary and mundane as an afternoon commute is transformed completely until it's hardly recognisable anymore. Of course, it's not the scariest horror film I've ever seen, and honestly it's not even close, but it's certainly one of my all-time favourites. I'm probably partly biased since this film just focuses on one of my biggest fears and others are more inclined to label it as an action thriller instead, but I suppose it all comes back to the old debate about what exactly decides a genre. Is it the director's original intent or the audience's interpretation of the film? It's a strange grey area when speaking about genre. The same grey area which allows Duel to be one of my favourite horror films, while at the same time allowing Psycho to be one of my favourite comedy films. But. In this Gene's opinion, that's a story for another day.